Okay. So, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of you, <laughs> depending on where you are joining from this event. Welcome to this event organized by the Gender Group and by the Department of Cultural and Political Changes of the Center for Development Research at the University of Bonn. Uh, please kindly note that this event is being recorded, so you are more than welcome to open your cameras, please. If not, it's, it's uh, your choice. Um, today is International Women's Day, a day that has been observed since the early 20th century. Um, and that was a strategy uh, to honor the women uh, movements uh, of women's rights uh, established by socialist women in Europe, women who were fighting for better working conditions, the rights to be elected and to elect the right to education and other rights that were denied to them. And more than one century later, the struggle continues in words of the uh, Amnesty International Organization, the last years have seen a dramatic deterioration in respect for women's rights. We, have, we can see that in the disadvantaged position of women in almost all indicators of the SDGs, the increase in gender-based violence in almost uh, or in many world regions, restrictions of women's rights, to education and of sexual and reproductive rights. And dramatically, we have seen the insurgence of anti-gender and anti-feminist movements linked to right and populist governments allied to conservative forces all around the world. But we also have some reasons to celebrate. And these reasons are women, past and present, who have played leading roles in standing up to patriarchy, sexism, discrimination, racism, and exploitation. We have female environmental defenders, young and adults from all over the world, peace activists, female health workers, women advocating for land rights, sexual and reproductive rights, political rights, the rights to fair food systems. And of course, there are male and female researchers who contribute disentangling the roots of gender oppression and inequality. And above all, the brave women who day to day push for a structural change wherever they are. So we mark this day, we celebrate these women by having this presentation on a very relevant discussion on post-colonial and decolonial feminism with specific examples of women collective action, examples of Brazil and Colombia. And for that, we have our two now very long friends and partners of CEF, uh, Dr. Renata Guimaraes Reinaldo and Dr. Michelle uh, Bonatti. Uh, Renata is a professor and a, research, uh, a researcher of the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. Welcome, Renata. And Michelle is a lecturer at the Humboldt University of Berlin on environmental policy and sociology and the deputy head of the Susland Group at the Leibniz Center for Agricultural Landscape Research. So uh, without further delay, please, uh, Renata, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Denise. Sorry. Thank you, everyone. Uh, it is a great, great pleasure to be here today to talk about our research in this so precious and valuable space for us to, to discuss, especially about in this important day that we have to, to recognize uh, the accomplishment, but also the challenges we still need to face in this uh, so difficult context as as Denise presented so well. So our presentation today uh, is going to be focusing on our uh, latest, latest research. Uh, so me and Michelle, my colleague, we are going to present uh, two case studies we have been working on lately in the last years. And uh, the title of our uh, presentation is Gender and Intersections in Latin America post-colonial and decolonial approaches. So uh, here today, it is important before starting the presentation 
uh, properly uh, to say from which perspectives we are departuring. So our perspectives of departure, they, they are the, the, the perspectives from dissident feminism. So what we call subaltern feminisms or feminisms from the South. So mainly from a decolonial approach, there is a, a contribution from Latin America, Latin American movements and scholars uh, to understand the complexities of the world. Seems that we have a problem yeah. here. Meanwhile, I welcome also Michelle. Thank you. I don't know if in an emergency case you will be able to. Yeah, I think I can. I'm sure that Henata would do this brilliantly more than me, but I can I can hold the, the content and, and go ahead. Just maybe give some minutes to Renata, see if she can return. Yeah, so as Renata is saying, it's important to, to explain from the part um, from which kind of perspective and with which kind of references we are dealing to understand our, uh, to guide our research in terms of, of feminists. So uh, here we present some uh, key references from the, for example, from the, the colonial feminists Feminism. We we work uh, very much guided by the knowledge bring by Maria Luganes uh, from the intersectional perspective, with a little bit with not the center, but also interconnect with the French materialism of Daniela Kegod and the Black feminists of Patri Patricia Hill Collins and Lelia Gonzalez, an eco feminist from Vandana, Vandana Shiva and Maria Mies, this here can talk better than the others, um, and the post-colonial feminist von Chandra Mohan. Um, so what it's very important for us and also in our research is have a critical look to the feminist field and the patriarchy, considering mainly two points, uh, the relations between the North and the South. Uh, yeah, great. She's there again, Henata. Thank you, thank you, Michelle. Great. I, I just I just did one <laughs> slide, so you can perfect. Thank continue. you very much. Welcome. Lost my connection. <laughs> Lost my connection here. Uh, so uh, this critical look, this dissident feminist perspective uh, that we are talking from here. So it's based from these two important uh, assumptions: this critical look to the feminist field. Um, but not only to the feminist field, but also to patriarchy, considering uh, the relations between North and South. And we, here we understand South as a metaphor of, of exclusion. So not only uh, regarding the divisions between countries uh, from global North and global South, and also considering the complexity of social relations due to the intersections uh, slash imbrications, because we are not making differentiations am among these, these expressions of gender with race, class, uh, uh, gender with race and class, like the, forming this triad of oppressions as axes of subordination and exploration. So these are important uh, critical perspectives from which we are departuring uh, here today. So uh, our presentation is going to be divided in three different moments from this, this dissident feminist perspectives uh, uh, we are basing our research and our analysis. Uh, we are going to, to present here in three different moments. So first moment, we are going to present the critiques of Western modernity or the colonial modern gender system. So this is important to, to understand our proposition and our research. Uh, in a second moment, we are going to focus on concepts that are central also for our reflections here. So the sexual, racial and international division of labor. And uh, the, the idea is to focus more on our uh, case studies, on the experiences we have been researching. So in the third part of our talk here today, we are going to present the cases of the Buckets Revolution and the female cocoa farmers in Colombia. Uh, so the first part, the critiques of Western modernity is a contribution of the colonial thought uh, to understand the global order, the current global order, so the, 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 mod, the Western modernity as a long historical process, to understand the contemporary context, the contemporary global order, and also the relations between global and local, as we are exploring in our research. So uh, our 
feminist perspective of departure and the, the colonial perspective of departure, uh, particularly, they are, they are strongly critical of Western modernity. And we are going to explain here very briefly uh, the, the meaning and the concepts regarding, regarding to it. So uh, what is important for us to say that uh, regarding to the colonial thought, what, what we call what is termed nowadays globalization is actually the culmination of a process that began with the constitution of America, with the invasion of Americas and colonial modern Eurocentered capitalism as a new global power. So this gives us a long historical perspective of our contemporary context, also to understand how all the process of uh, colonization and the constitution of capitalism and patriarchy along modernity, they shape the world we live in today. So uh, a very, very important concept, a central concept to, to understand here is the, the one of coloniality that is defined by Maldonado Torres as referring to long-standing patterns of power that emerged as a result of colonialism, but that define culture, labor, intersubjective uh, relations, and knowledge production well beyond the strict limits of colonial administrations. That means the coloniality is something that is present nowadays, even after the end of colonialism as a formal way of administration of colonies uh, from, from the colonizers' countries. So colonialism in this perspective denotes a political and economic relation in which the sovereignty of a nation or a people rests on the power of another nation which makes such a nation an empire. So this is very important for us to understand that for the colonial thought, coloniality shapes the world nowadays and influences the world nowadays even after the formal end of colonialism. And this is central for our reflection and here today. So going further, in that sense, Western modernity for the decolonial thought is a long duration project of domination whose darker side is coloniality. So the idea is to show that what we call modernity or Western modernity or Eurocentered modernity, Euro-Anglo-centered modernity, uh, it also, also actually has a, a darker side, a side that is often uh, invisibilized, which is coloniality. So uh, the idea is to show, to, to make visible the coloniality as the darker side, side of modernity. So that's why the expression modernity slash coloniality is so, uh, modern, uh, modernity slash coloniality is so essential for us here today. So uh, this to say that the contemporary global order is fundamentally shaped and permanently reshaped by the imbrications or the interconnections, the intersections of global capitalism, patriarchy that we understand here as masculine domination, aspiration, and coloniality or neocolonial relations as some, some feminist authors uh, call. Uh, and these imbrications between capitalism, patriarchy, and coloniality conform what we have as a global matrix of power, in the words of Patricia Hugh Collins, or a colonial modern gender systems, in the words of Maria Lugones. So uh, this colonial modern capitalist patriarchy sustains and perpetuates the structural domination and exploration of women, particularly poor racialized women from the South, through the sexual, racial, and international divisions of labor. So just to, to uh, finish this first part of the presentation with this important assumption, it, it is to understand that this imbrication, this global matrix of power creates global hierarchies through the axis of subordination of gender, race, and class that we are highlighting here. And the implications of this axis of subordination, they are sustained and they perpetuate the sexual, racial, and international divisions of labor. They also operate in imbricated, in interconnected ways as we are arguing here as well. Uh, so that said, we then are going to pass to the second part of our talk here today. Can you can you hear the can you see the, the presentation properly? Yes. Yes. Okay. 
Uh, okay, so now the second part is the sexual ratio and international division of labor that, as I said, are important concepts for us to understand the, our research and the intersection of feminist accounts of Western subordinate Western subordination of, of women, as we are arguing here. Uh, okay, so uh, I brought here, we brought here a concept of Daniel Kerguan, uh, of first to understand the sexual division of labor. And uh, in her understanding, the sexual division of labor is the form of social work division that arises from social sex relations. That is, there are this division of work that is based on a naturalization, on a biologization of, uh, of social practices. So this is a very important point for us to understand. The argument is biological, but of course we are talking of social practices, as we stress also. Uh, in our perspectives. So, uh, of course, this is like an ar architectural concept, but although the modalities of sexual division of labor, they vary strongly in time and space, and they can only be understood in the local context, uh, adapted to each society, to each historical context, it is important to understand that the sexual division of labor in capitalist society since the the, the beginning of industrial capitalism maybe is based on two organizing principles. So the principle of separation that divides what is understood as work of men and work of women. And also there is the principle of, of hierarchization. So there is this division, but also uh, the creation of, of some kind of hierarchy in which the work of men has more, more value than the work of women in this uh, social constructions. So, uh, the, trans so the transition here, uh, in her words, so the sexual division of labor is characterized by the priority destination of men to the productive sphere of life and of women to the reproductive sphere of life and simultaneously the attribution of men to the functions of strong added social value like political, religions, and military social value. So this is very important because uh, sexual division of labor is still very present, still shapes and reshapes the structures of societies under uh, the, the capitalism is still nowadays. So it, it is important from understand from this concept uh, first that the productive sphere is sustained and reproduced by the reproductive sphere. So there is this, this work, this invisible undervalued work that is not even recognized or perceived as work and often uh, justified by emotions or love or the myth of maternity and many uh, social constructions. So this invisible non-paid work of women in the household is actually what sustains the productive sphere. Uh, and also sustains the female subordination still nowadays. And also the sexual division of labor is also reproduced in the labor market. So we have more recently the divisions between male professions and female professions also regarding to gender roles and also uh, representing a devaluation of female professions or of female work. So uh, women, women and they end up performing the most undervalued and precarious work related to care in the labor market. This is very important for the our, our studies, our case studies, and we can discuss more later about it when we present to you our, uh, our results and all the, the architecture of the, of the research. So, uh, it is important also to understand that, of course, the sexual division of labor, it is an architectural concept, so it operates differently in different contexts, and of course, it doesn't affect we all women in the same way. So this access to labor market, uh, if we are focusing, focusing on this access to labor market, it is different. Uh, among women. Uh, so, of course, regarding the, the class and the racial background of women, they access the labor market and they are affected by the sexual division of labor in different ways. And many women actually, they get, they, they have access to the labor market or they are not so 
uh, burned by the responsibility with uh, the, the reproductive work because they have the possibility to outsource this responsibility and not because we have substantial structural changes uh, despite all the, the conceptualization and the struggle against sexual division of labor that we have um, until nowadays. So uh, this, this is very important for us to understand that women are different, uh, are affected in different ways depending on their ratio and the, their class backgrounds. So uh, it, for our intersectional perspective, this is very important because women in social disadvantage and many times in implication of gender with other axes of subordination like class and race ethnicity, they are more affected by the sexual and the racial division of labor. And the risk is that the domination and exploitation can be perpetuated also among women do, uh, do, uh, regarding the sexual division of labor that is not only sexual, it's also a racial division of labor. So uh, in the words of Flavia Biroli, which, uh, which is a Brazilian researcher and thinking about these intersections, uh, the sexual division of labor is anchored, as I said also, in the naturalization of relations of authority and subordination that are presented biologically based and are racially justified. So race is very, uh, it's a very important element to understand concepts as uh, the concepts we have in, in Latin America, Brazilian context, and the Colombian context as well, that we are going to talk a bit more, a uh, little bit more later. So uh, together, the restrictions defined by gender, race, and social class, they shape the choices and they unevenly uh, impose responsibility and encourage certain occupations while blocking or hindering access to others. Others. That, that means to say that different women regarding the class and race background, they occupy different social places um, and they can be more or less impacted by social, sexual division of labor in intersection with uh, racial division of labor. But also uh, for us, it is important to understand as well that we don't have only a sexual and a racial division of labor. And it is also uh, necessary to highlight that when we say race here, of course, uh, it is necessary to look to, to the national context, uh, to the local context to understand the particularities of, of race and the implications with class and gender in that concept. But we also talk uh, about race on a global level, on a macro level, understanding the processes of uh, colonization and enslavement that actually has as a result the phenomenon uh, the phenomenon of racism racism in local concepts so I, I believe this is also uh, important to 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 explain and to stress and we can also talk a bit more later about these relations between the global and the local which we explore in our in our research uh, Okay, so, uh, okay, it is important so to say that we have not only a sexual and a racial division of labor, but also an international division of labor. And this is, this is fundamental for us here to, to perceive the colonial processes and the processes of enslavement that relate, related to the colonial processes um, as also interconnected and influencing the local context. So uh, to understand the concept, the international division of labor is to understand that the global matrix of power and the, the, its capitalist world economy is based on sexual and racial division of labor and also on an international division of labor uh, by which colonies were subjected and exploited along Western modernity through the process of colonization. So this is also central and our perception here is also based uh, on this understanding of Western modernity we talk about in the first part of the presentation. So uh, the, this international division of labor during the formation of industrial capitalism in particularly, um, it is the, the, the result, for instance, of this division uh, of, of, of labor that is represented by the production of raw materials in the colonies and ex-colonies in Latin America, Africa, and Asia by cheap and enslaved 
uh, labor, and they were sent to industrial countries in Europe and uh, later in the US uh, to be transformed into industrial products. So uh, from the, the colonial perspective, if we see in, in a global uh, in a global way and and put into account the global phenomenon, the global flows, uh, it is important to recognize that all the development of capitalism and the, the production, the, the development, of, uh, development of industries in the North was, uh, was based, it was possible due to the raw materials produced in the colony. So this international division of labor, it persists nowadays. We still have a very um, unequal global order and it, this is due to coloniality. That is a concept that we also have presented before. So the countries from the South, they still occupy a disadvantaged position in global value chains, in international political institutions, and they face deep structural problems that result in the marginalization of historically oppressed social groups uh, still nowadays, which is also uh, something we are highlighting here. Okay, so uh, just to finish the second part, the intersectional uh, perspectives is necessary for us to understand also the interconnections between sexual, racial, and international division of labor. So bringing this intersectional perspective regarding uh, women, uh, it is important to understand that while, for instance, middle and upper class European women uh, along the development of industrial capitalism were confined to the household in the beginning of the first industrial revolution, poor women were since then serving as a cheap workforce uh, in the factories and racialized women were being enslaved in the colonies. So this global perspective give us, gives us an understanding of these interconnections between these sexual divisions of labor uh, we, are, we are discussing here. So the division of labor established by colonial modern capitalist patriarchy has, has been, has since then, has been, um, since the industrial revolution has been not only sexual, but also racial and international. And this is also important because it's going to be part of our reflections and we can of course explore more in the, in the discussion, discussion as well. Okay, so uh, we are, uh, I just brought here a sentence from Chandra Mohanty, a post-colonial feminism uh, that, that is very emblematic to, to say, to talk about how poor racialized worker women from the South, they are particularly affected by the, the, the current context of globalization. So how the global matrix of power affects particularly poor worker racialized women from the South. So for her, it is girls and women around the world, especially in the third world South that bear the brunt of globalization. So poor women and girls are the hardest hit by the degradation of environmental conditions, wars, mines, privatization of services and deregulation of governments, dismantling of welfare states, restructuring of paid and unpaid work, increasing surveillance and incarceration in prisons and so on. So, on. so this is why a feminism without and beyond borders is necessary to address the injustices of global capitalism. So we are going to explore this, this idea and to talk more about this uh, in the concrete cases, concrete cases, our case studies that we are going to present then in the last part of our talk here today. Okay, so uh, we are going to present two case studies that have been the object of our research lately. So we've been researching uh, them for, for a while, and I'm going to present the case of the Buckets Revolution, and Michelle is going to present the case of female cocoa farmers in Colombia. So uh, first talking about the Buckets uh, Revolution, the Buckets Revolution, so the, the title of this work, which is, is still in progress, so feel free to make the dialogue and contributions for, for the discussion. So the, the title of this, this work so far is Women of the Revolution and Politics of Care. 
So we are proposing a gender intersected approach on an initiative to address social, social environmental problems in a marginalized country in Southern Brazil. So we are talking about the city of Florianópolis and a marginalized community in this city. And it is, as you can see, a collective project. It was written by me, but it's, it's a part of a bigger project, Sucon project, that is part of South. And Michelle can also talk a little bit about it later. And we are co-authors in these papers, along with other researchers from different areas, which makes this a very interesting interdisciplinary and international project of research. So uh, the Buckets Revolution, uh, it is, I'm going, so just before talking about the Bucket Revolution, just to highlight that the, the project, it's called, uh, the research project is called SUCON, so Social Ecological Innovations of Communities in the Global South, and it aims to investigate the social ecological impacts of the Buckets Revolution. So we have many different perspectives and colleagues working from us from different areas and it, the project is part of the work group Sustainable Land Use in Developing Countries, Susland from South. So uh, the Buckets Revolution, it is, it is an initiative uh, arising in 2008 in Southern uh, Brazil, uh, in the city of Florianópolis, the state of Santa Catarina in Southern Brazil. And the Buckets Revolution was uh, initiated in, in a marginalized community in a favela in the city of Florianópolis, uh, mainly uh, led by women in the community. So uh, the, the initiative started because of a very difficult and a very challenging social ecological problem because they have an outbreak of rats and cases of leptospirosis in the community. Sorry, I'm not just not. I'm not getting to pass to the next. Ah, okay. It's just, it's just a bit slow, but it's it's going. So uh, it is it was led by women. It's still nowadays led by women by by in a black territory, that is important also to say. So this marginalized community is a black territory, of course, in the context of, of Brazil, but we are also here intending to connect this local level to also this perspective of the global level, this global matrix of power. So this is important to understand the relations between global and local. So uh, the Buckets Revolution is a waste management initiative that was implemented through a network of people in this community, this marginalized community, along with local institutions. So it is actually based, it was initially based on a composting system. So to, to resolve the case of the the rats outbreak and the leptospirosis cases, uh, they started to make this, this waste collection in the community, the organic waste uh, mainly, to, to avoid the problem because the problem was in fact created by the lack of public care because the community didn't have the waste collection in their territory. So uh, they started to collect this organic waste and to make this if from the, with the help of the university, they implemented this composting system um, that helped with uh, to, to solve this problem. And a long time, other initiatives uh, came from the Buckets Revolution. So beyond the composting system, they now have the mother kitchen, they have the thrift store, they have the, uh, the creative sewing workshop. And that is also very interesting because as women are leading the initiative, we can see the gender roles in the initiative, but also they are proposing a totally different and, uh, and I, I could say revolutionary perspective to care that is important for us to understand here. So these women, uh, they led, they still led, they still conduct the initiative nowadays, and they implemented and are still conducting it to resist their condition of intersected subordinations in this Black territory. So it is also important to say in this sense that Black women, because of intersectional uh, intersectional subordination, the relations between gender, sex, and race in the Brazilian context, 
they occupy the basis of the social pyramid and the black territories, they are particularly, they occupy a particularly uh, challenging place of marginalization in Brazilian society. So uh, these intersections of subordinations, they affect particularly these women and particularly uh, this, this community. So the fact, for instance, that there was no sufficient waste collection, it is, um, it is emblematic for us to understand this place of marginalization that Black communities occupy in Brazilian uh, society. So from this context, uh, we have uh, here the, the theoretical basis, and I'm about to finish to to pass to Michelle, but just to present for you the architecture of the work, and we can also uh, please keep talking about uh, uh, about it in the discussion. But it's, I, I believe it is important in accordance with what we, what we have been discussing here so far, that we are basing the, the, the perspective, the reflections on, of course, intersectional perspectives uh, on dissident feminisms, and intersectional perspectives centered on gender and interconnection with race and class mainly. So uh, of course the work of Maria Lugones is important for us here, but also uh, are very important the works of Patricia Hill Collins, Lélia Gonzalez, Angela Davis, so uh, Chandra Mohanty, Aftar Bra, and Daniel Pigoa. But Patricia Hill Collins and Lélia Gonzalez mainly, uh, they talk about this triad of oppressions. They talk about the relations between race, class, and gender in contexts marked by colonization and enslavement. So uh, they are very important to understand this particular case we are we are studying with the bucket revolution. Uh, so uh, our perspective here, I think it is very important also to say our intersectional perspective here, uh, okay, it is based uh, not in a fixed understanding of intersections. And of course we are talking about social places, but we understand that these intersections, they are fluid and they need, they need to be understood as fluid, not as, um, as a fatal destination, but as social structures that have force, of course, they have their strength, but they have been challenging uh, since always through the resistance of these women that are particularly affected by these intersections. So I think it is important to say because there are many different perspectives on intersectionality inside the feminist field. And for the dissident understandings we are highlighting here, uh, the triad of oppressions is essential, uh, but we highlight here that our understanding of intersectionality is not fixed and intends to connect the global and the local level. So uh, Patricia Hugh Collins is very important in this sense because uh, she stresses that in a global level, uh, we, we talk about interlocking systems of oppression, this global matrix of power, and the effects of the global level in the local level, they are in fact what she calls intersectionality. So how this axis of subordination intersect in a global level. So our perspective here intends to, to have these this connections between a macro perspective and a micro perspective. So uh, it is also important to say that uh, the intersectional feminist perspective in a, is not only our theoretical framework, but is also our epistemology and our methodology. And this, this is also central for us here because uh, thinking about epistemology, uh, this perspective gives us the, the necessity to understand the positionality, both the researcher and the community and women there that are being researched or that are building their research together and the reflexivity in this the reflexivity in this research so uh, it is regarding to the epistemology important to understand that the social place of the researchers and the social place of the community and women that are being researched or building together this research it needs to be considered to understand how these case study is going to be analyzed and, and to give a more objective, uh, a more objective account or uh, a more academic honesty to the, the understanding because the, the positionality of people uh, influences 
how we are going to analyze and the results of the research. So in the case, uh, it is important to say that I'm one of the authors, but as uh, a, a, a woman from a light skin in the Brazilian society from middle class, but uh, that I, I, as a researcher, also position myself in this epistemological framework. So as someone that has some relative advantage, advantages and disadvantages in this co particular co context, and uh, the community and the women of the revolution as women that are particularly intensively affected by the intersections of subordination between gender, class, and race in their in their, their particular context. And we also considering this based on black feminism as a vantage standpoint, which would be um, a disadvantage point in terms of the social society structure, but also an advantage point to understand how these intersections operate uh, in a complex way in the local context. So they give us, they, they, they can, from their context and from the resistance they are building, they can understand this global matrix of power and the local context in these complexities. So they help us also to understand these complexities. And regarding the methodology, of course, the intersectional perspective is also the path the methodological path we have been following in the research because the intention was to define the problems and, and the objectives from women's concrete experience and struggles to be sensitive to intersections of power structures that affect these women with the aim to contribute to concrete changes in their uh, condition of oppression. So the intersection, this, this dissident intersection, intersectional perspective, it is our theoretical basis, our epistemological basis, and our methodological path. So um, from this, we are now talking a bit about the problems and the problem and the objective. So our main uh, problem here um, was to investigate the configuration of the complex relations between their political practice and the responsibility for care. And uh, uh, the responsibility for care here is understood not only as a core element of women's intersectional subordination, as we have been talking previously in the second part of our talk today, but the responsibility for care in their context or as they have been building the initiative is simultaneously understood as a central value for a new and revolutionary politics of care. So the study of the, the case in the local context gave us the possibility to see that they are not only affected by the responsibility for care due to sexual relation division of labor, but they are also presenting a new perspective on care that is a result from their particular historical and social place. And this was like very interesting for us to, to see because they have the possibility to, to challenge the sexual division of labor because they see care as much more valuable, as, as much valuable and in a different perspective from the sexual division of labor. So this is something that we would like to stress here, to highlight here. So from this question, uh, from this problem, the objectives were to understand how these women, how the women of the revolution uh, from their intersected social place, how they are particularly affected by sexual and international division, racial in, and international division of, of labor, and also how they have been building a politics of care based on their particular understanding of care and as a form of resistance to the marginalization. So, of course, we don't have time to talk about all the, the details, but we can talk later in the discussion. But just to close my part, so uh, the key findings for us uh, here are the, due to the intersections of gender, race, and class that affect particularly poor women, poor worker, racialized women from the side, South and Black women in the Brazilian society, that they are overloaded by the, 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 this division of labor, by this undervalued and precarious 
paid and unpaid care work, as well by the absence of the public policies and services in neglected communities. So we, of course, we uh, understood this, this overload. This was part of our research, but uh, they also present a, a different perspective on care from this one that base that the base bases that is the base for the sexual division of labor. So uh, this this presents some kind of uh, of possibility to to transform and, and to change the way we perceive care uh, in Western societies because at the same time care is seen uh, it puts these women in their social place. In a, in a place of disadvantage, of subordination, but at the same time, it is a humanizing factor, especially in Brazil, in contexts like Brazil, for black women uh, in contexts marked by the violence of enslavement processes. So care for them regarded because of this history of pain and suffering and all the, the horrors we have with the colonization and enslavement, uh, they they didn't have the possibility to care for themselves, so they they perceive care on a humanizing perspective, and they bring this humanizing perspective, this this uh, this they they give great value to care uh, in their particular context, and this is this is this has a very strong potential to social change because it it bases the the political practices practices they have been building there. And uh, by developing these politics of care, by, by conducting the care work that is undervalued, precarious, and a factor of intensified subordination for Black women in Western cultures, uh, they are at the same time challenging. So they challenge this, this human and non-human dichotomy that is a result, result of colonization and a result of enslavement, as defined by Maria Lugoni. So, they are in fact doing uh, uh, with a political practice based on care, they are creating uh, a political practice that is revolutionary and they, they are building a contextualized, horizontal, bottom-up, care-based, counter-hegemonic alternative to address the social environmental problems resulted from the intersex, intersected subordinations in the Brazilian context. Well, and that's it. Of course, we have a lot to, to talk about, but I'm 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 extended my talk too much, so I'm going to pass to Michelle and we can talk more, more about it later. Thank you. Thank you, Renata. Thank you very much. I think I can shorter as much as possible the presentation just to bring some of the brilliant uh, theoretical insights that Renata just talked, and then we can open for questions. Otherwise, I think the audience will not have time to to ask, so I will short as much as possible just to give you an overview of a second case where we bring all the logic, this, this conceptual rationality in a concrete real world example. Um, we can also answer all the questions about the both projects, the Sus, uh, Sukon project, as Renata mentioned now, and this now we'll talk about Sulu's project, this sustainable land use um, strategies um, to target in Colombia peace building process and forestation process, uh, basically focus on mitigation and climate mitigation. This is a project founded uh, by the ISAIKI initiative, so International Climate Initiative, uh, that I'm coordinating here in SALF, and uh, we have um, we had the funds from the founding from the BMUV. Um, so the next, just to give you an overview of what we were focused in the overall project, we are uh, promoting focus in peace building and mitigation to also promote gender equitable value change, which are seen as a platform to, to contribute not only for conservation and climate change and peace building as we, as we wanted, but also possibly to make more evidence, ev evident the, the gender roles and how we could better promote uh, equity on this on this frame. So what we want on this on the research on this component, so just one part of a brick project. So this was only one one um, 
research component that was, by the way, I forgot to say before, that was conducted also by my colleagues, uh, mainly um, Charlotte Mead and Tatiana Rodriguez that could not be here today. And what we want there was uh, understand the gender, do a, a gender-based analysis of the role of the farmers and the Colombia cocoa value chain. Go please to the next. Uh, methodologically, we have based our research and semi-structured interviews with almost 80, um, 80 experts in cocoa value chain. We did two rounds then on the ground, basically as exploratory study to understand the gender labor division among the cocoa farmers uh, and what are the gender-based constraints of women. Um, uh, and also we did like a set of in-deep interviews with those experts uh, in, in the department of Cesar for people that are familiar with, um, this is on the north of Colombia for people that are familiar with the country. Uh, for the next. Uh, what we then wanted to, what we found as a result, um, basically, uh, in terms of what are the, the roles of women in the cocoa, within the cocoa chain, is that they are basically associated to what are the unpaid care roles, which is the typical structure that we see theoretically and also in the first case here presented today. So they are, um, the women in the cocoa value chain, they are basically responsible for, for the harvest and the post-harvest post activities, uh, but also for the fermentation and the drying process, which are normally the, which follow very much the principle of what Kegoa said. Women are here associated to the, uh, are very much example of the principle of separation and the principle of hierarchization. So those kind of activities are the ones that are, First of all, they have a role. So the, those are the work of women, which are not mainly the production, uh, but yes, the processing part of the, of the value chain, but also the hierarchization, because here the men, the work of men value more than the men, the work of women. Those uh, kind of activities are also um, the ones that are normally not targeted by most of the projects, since the projects um, normally also the agricultural projects, and that's the context what I'm what I'm seeing here. There is my my lens. This is mainly uh, agricultural project, sustainable agricultural projects, and most of the projects follow this what Haberman say always as instrumental rationality. So focus in a better production and a more sustainable, more clean production, a more green production, but um, but this many times mask the role of other process, for example, the, the harvesting and the post-harvesting. So we normally projects don't target those kind of, of activities, which are the, the main ones conducted by women. So we suffer here a double process. We have a double, a double process of exclusion, a local process of exclusion because the production is associated to men, which normally is also the one that sell the product Therefore, the financial resources are more managed for men, while the harvest and the post-harvest is not associated with receiving the, the financial resources locally. So we have a double process of exclusion here, as well as we also do not see association or membership or capacity building programs for this kind of activities. Um, so again, for the uh, yeah, the next. Mm -hmm. um, so we are also as a, as some uh, conclusions, and to be very short in our, our presentation, uh, very quick in our presentation. Uh, what we what we mainly focus here also as a recommendation and conclusion is that developing projects and with especially with this agriculture. Uh, background have to rethink the, the rationality, avoid to continue following the, the instrumental rationality, which normally focus on productivity and mark assets, because this exclude more of uh, exclude the most of the 
women roles and is, is taking here the example of the cocoa chain and also focus to and the gender the gender differences the gender roles and foster the capacities to to properly um, to properly do the process itself technically but also to recognize and enhance the role of women um, of the farmers and the women farmers and the and the cocoa chain uh, which was the case here but it also can be exemplified with other with other examples and we focus very much here and the gender here although we had the overview of intersectionality and also understanding that the the whole cocoa chain has itself uh, international uh, division at sense that mostly the countries the global south is producing the cocoa while the the most valued chocolates are being processed by by the north although it has been questioning, it's still the operant modus of production and certainly also a rational role here playing a role, although in this research, we focus very much on the gender role. Um, the next, I think I just already mentioned that we are founded by the, by the initiative. And I think this is a very interesting perspective for the both cases here. One, it's um, a, a, a internal project that SUCON is an internal project that gives us also more flexibility to focus on different um, kind of approach and understanding and theoretical background. And while the second case, it uh, has to follow much more the, the instrumental rationality and play along with this, although trying to propose different things. I think that's all. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Renata and Michelle. This is, has been really great. Thank you for this very holistic presentation, very comprehensive about the theoretical parts of gender constructions, social uh, sex relations, practices, intersectionality, and of course, the two very well explained case studies. We have called to this meeting till 12.15, so we still have some time. So uh, if any of you has comments, uh, please just uh, raise your hand. Uh, if you have a question, something to discuss. If not, I would very much would like to start shortly. I don't see any hand so far. I would like to start with a, a conceptual question to both of you, Renata and Michelle, and maybe something more out of curiosity, considering that is International Women's Day. The conceptual um, question is that the issue of race is very much um, discussed by um, Black feminism and, and not by feminism in other areas of the southern parts of the world. For example, in Latin America, the issue of race is very much rejected and uh, the issue of ethnicity and more sociocultural backgrounds are more uh, reivindicated, let's say. How you solve this and how you discuss that in Brazil. And the other question that is more general is what, what are your experiences at the universities in Brazil trying to advance this post-colonial and the colonial perspective given the backlash of anti-feminism and anti-genderism, uh, uh, conservative movements, particularly those promoted by, by the ex-Bolsonaro president. So these very two, if you can go very short, please. So there is also space for others to ask questions. Thank you. Of course. Thank you, Denise. A very, very important questions. Um, we focus particularly on Black feminist contributions because of the, uh, the, the case of the Buckets Revolution. Mainly, it, it, it demanded uh, from us this perspective. So uh, Black feminism for, for us was fundamental regarding the, the, the racism, racism as, as a a phenomenon that is a result from colonization and enslavement. But we also have, like, especially here in Brazil, a very important uh, perspective from Lélia Gonzalez, and she proposes exactly that, how we can think about coalitions and alliances and the complexi complexities between race and ethnicity. So she, she also um, uh, embraces in her theoretical contributions what she calls America Latina, which is to understand Latin America 
uh, not only, uh, in particularly the, the dissident feminist field, not only regarding Black women, but uh, also he, regarding indigenous women. So uh, our, our reality in, in Brazil is, is very particular in that sense. And, and that's why she, she was theorizing in, in this, uh, considering this particular configuration of our society because of the whole historical of uh, not only indigenous genocide, but also the black people enslavement and genocide here in Brazil, but uh, in the other countries uh, uh, and also in the, the colonial thought, this this ethnical um, this this axis of ethnicities is is stronger. So I think Lila Gonzalez brings a great contribution for us to think about this this relation between race and, and ethnicity because race is reivindicated as uh, a social construct you know, that, that was uh, constructed by uh, scientific uh, theorized by scientific races, but it, that is also reivindicated nowadays. To, to understand the implications and to, to base the struggle against these structures. So I think her contribution is very important. And here in Brazil, uh, we, we still have a division inside the field. I mean, there is uh, the dissident perspectives are very critical from uh, the, the hegemonic perspectives on feminism. So we are also stressing all the time, stressing the importance of intersections because uh, in this understanding, a feminism that is not intersectional, that doesn't uh, understand how gender implicates with race, ethnicity, and, and class, it, it is not only insufficient, but it, it, it takes the risk to reinforce the other axis of subordination. So the field is divided. In Brazilian academia, we are is still in the margins of academia, not only in, in feminism, but particularly in dissident feminism. And uh, Otto Curiel, she has a, a very important understanding about this. She says that saying that you are a dissident feminism puts you on a place of marginalization, also inside academia and, and, and the study. So it's divided, but we know that the field is disputed and it, it is part also of, of our complexities. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Renata. Thanks a lot. I don't know if Michelle wants to add something or? No, I think it's it's a brilliantly explained. I'm very much in contact with the with the Brazilian context, although I'm doing the research here from the north, from Germany. So it's also a, an interesting perspective to see how those academic disputes are taking place and how we can deal with it and persist with this, because as I think this is one of the, the key the key um, roles as a researcher is to keep using, to keep explore, to keep exploiting, and to keep looking for those uh, concepts constantly. And sometimes even, and then I said from here, from the by staying in the north, I also keep using and keep uh, keep really attached to this logic. Although sometimes it has to be somehow masked or somehow do some kind of makeup and the kind of concepts that you are using to be more acceptable. Because I think this, this the, the margin also applied for here in the context in Europe is not all only the acceptable bring those kind of concepts. So sometimes it's also a way that we have to, to translate a kind of logics to be to continue doing research on the context here on the north. Great, thank you, thank you, Michelle. Okay, so um, let's go. I had a, a hand up from um, Minelli, but I have lost here, unfortunately. I have now Renzo. Renzo, if you would like to open your camera or your microphone and make your own question, that would be great. Uh, hi, Dennis. Thank you, and thanks for the interesting presentation. Um, I have, I think, two questions. One is regarding the sort of conceptual framework that uh, Renata presented at the beginning. Uh, and and um, so it is about how um, much stress you put on, on the uh, global capitalism system being a so, a sort of a cause of all these, uh, what you call intersected subordinations, right? If I understood correctly. And um, it seems you situate this issue in, in, in both in a present process, but also in a historical process, if again, if I'm not wrong. Uh, but it, uh, we, I would say that uh, in historical terms, the um, global capitalism was not uh, let's say the only uh, 
economical or political economy uh, system. And I wonder whether, and that was quite recent, I would say, I wonder whether in other type of um, political economy systems, let's say the, the, the social or communist bloc in the 60s and their influence in African countries would have produced or did produce a similar uh, outcome in terms of these subordinations. Did you have research on that? Was different given a different uh, economy uh, or political economy structure? That would be uh, my first question. And the second question is more related to the second part of the presentation, which Michel uh, presented. Um, and uh, my question would be, since we are talking of uh, about value chains, which are part of uh, yeah the global economy and so on, what what are the structures that might be reproducing the patterns of uh, intersected subordination and how to avoid them in these uh, value chains? To I mean, let's say how to fix um, global capitalism. We, mm -hmm. from the perspective of feminism and uh, justice and so on. Thank you. Thank you, Renzo. Thank you. They are very, these are very interesting questions. Actually, our focus is like uh, to understand the contemporary context of neoliberal globalization. So looking back to understand as the colonial uh, thought says, like the, the current globalization as the culmination of this long historical process. So I think that the, the main point is that uh, the, from in this global matrix of power, uh, capitalism was like built together with patriarchy and coloniality. I think this, this two, these three systems uh, were built historically together to culminate in the context we have today, of course, after the end of the Cold War, after the end of the, with many, many commas, the, the end of history, and considering nowadays the, the context of neoliberal globalization after the collapse of the of the socialist world, as we can say. But of course, if we look to this context, we have research specifically about it that is very interesting. Uh, of course, women subordination, it is, it doesn't start in modernity as we all know, but uh, the, understand, it, the, the intention is to understand the modern roots to the, the current context of uh, neoliberal globalization or corporate globalization that we have today. If we look particularly to the, the this uh, socialist experience, for for example, we can uh, we have interesting studies to show how uh, women's subordination happen happened also in these contexts in these complexities because it, 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 in every situation, of course, is going to be complex, and we have many forms of subordination, sometimes perpetrated by the state or by the market. So uh, the challenge and the subordination it's it's commonly uh, multifactorial in, in concepts. So I think our, our focus uh, from the decolonial perspective is mainly to understand this, this current context as the result of this long historic, historical, historical process. And uh, I guess you had another question, sorry, about uh, this first theoretical part. Not sure if I'm addressing uh, everything. <laughs> no, yes, thank you. You did for the first part. I actually uh, thought uh, Michelle could answer the second question. She, since yeah. she's more into uh, the value chain issues, and my question, if if I don't know if I have to repeat it, but you don't okay. need to repeat. I remember very well because it's a quite impressive question: how to fix the global capitalism. I even took a note here. Say, so, oh my God, this is a big question. How are we gonna how are we gonna answer it? Um, and thank you for your question. I think um, there is, I mean, there is multiple perspectives about this issue, right? Um, I think when you think about value chain, it just show very much this structure of domination, not only in COCOA, in this case that I present, but in many of the projects, we still have the logic of importing the, the, the prime material and buying the, the processed material. It happens for chocolate, for example, uh, so in terms of very specifically and concrete, in terms of the project, what we did was what we are doing because we are in the final uh, year of this project is work with the 
closing the value chain at local level. So they are also processing, packing, and selling the product locally. So we don't have to just in, uh, just to export the cacao and buy the chocolate, but do the whole process locally. That's what we are doing uh, concretely to give you an example. But in a more macro level, I think this is a very uh, uh, structurated issue from, from that operates from global level. So it's not that simple. I think there is those local initiatives that when they get bigger and bigger, they somehow start to transform and have a, a big impact at global level. I could mention here even the movement of agroecology, for example, which was when I was starting to work with this 20 years ago, agroecology was very much marginalized and very much exclude of the most agriculture academic logic. We are more or less like a, just a small group. And nowadays you have like European calls only for agroecology, for example, which is a big advance and it happens in 20 years. So if it's too long or too short, uh, it's, a, it's a kind of also a particular understanding. But in 20 years, those kind of different logics has grown a lot in terms of agroecology, for example. Uh, so I think this local initiatives are important, but from also, and this is another perspective that, as I said, there is a lot of perspectives here to, to see also from the logic of research projects and development projects, there is a nature of those projects, and that's what we have here. We have financial resources from the from some countries and a certain agenda that we have to follow. And this logic is already making difficult to, to, to really have transformative process because for example, when, and we have to survive as, as researchers, I think most of you know, we need to propose, uh, to make proposals, project proposals that are fitting a certain agenda and we can somehow put different components as we did in this one, but the whole logic behind is already have this nature that somehow helps to reproduce this, this dominance. We cannot propose, of course, and we know for many reasons, but there is not a proposed agenda from the south to the north for what has to be, what has to be researched, right? We need, we go to research what the north said that has to be researched. And this logic already said a lot of how we persist with this with these systems of, of domination. When, and I think this is very important and also a global but a, a individual reflection that we should do when we are doing research from the proposed agenda from the North, what we can edit as local. And the SUCOM project, the project of bucket revolution, the research on the bucket revolution come from this reflection, come to, okay, we, we want to understand what it effectively is already uh, operating in the global south, because the, the this instrumental nationality, what we have normally in the projects, we is, is is that we have to propose solutions or we have to create with the local the solutions. But the locals already have a lot of solutions, and this is what we see in the bucket revolutions. They have a local solution. They need to be they need to be supported because they have a lot of struggles in terms of keeping the project financially. But they have a they have a solution, and that's what we are always more or less from the north trying to create. We are trying to create solutions, and I think this is this is a, a very important reflection to have is to change this logic, this capitalism logic, is also to understand what is already successfully successfully be operating in the global south. And I think this is normally not the focus on the projects that we have here in the north, at least from from the agricultural science perspective. Great. So I think these are excellent words to, to, to close our event, unless there are there is a urgent comment or question, which I don't see here. It has been really great. I just can agree with the reflection of Michelle, and I think many of us uh, do that. And going back to the initial words of this event, Commemorating International Women's Day, it's important to mention, it's a lot to lament, the struggle goes on, but there is also a lot to celebrate and that has to do with this, the work of, of many women and men also fighting for a more, uh, for more equal gender and not only gender, but for a more equal social, for more equal social relations. 
So thank you very much. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Renata. And thanks to each of you for, for being here. Um, have a great day and hope to see you soon in the name of the gender group and the organizers of the Safe A Colloquium. No? Have a good day.